to agent Josephine Baker with Damian Lewis and John Mendez. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education here at the International Spy Museum in Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, our featured guest, Damian Lewis, is discussing his new book, Agent Josephine. He'll do a presentation and then be interviewed by John and Mendez. John is a former CIA chief of disguise and a spy museum advisory board member. And like the rest of us at the Spy Museum, she is a huge Josephine Baker fan. She will give Damien a proper introduction soon. But before I disappear for a little bit, I wanted to tell you uh, just a, a little bit about how Josephine Baker appears in the Spy Museum. She's included in an exhibit we call Who Would Have Guessed? And that is because most people are used to seeing Josephine Baker like this and not like this. Johnny, you had a story, I think, about this photograph. Well, well, I did. Um, I was in Paris many years ago. I'm trying to come up with the date and I cannot. I had my cameras, my tripods. Uh, I was not with Tony, not with my son, so it was earlier. And I was walking by the Luxembourg Gardens. They have a huge wrought iron fence that runs the, the, the length of the garden all around it, um, blocks and blocks. And on that fence were these enormous black and white photos of Josephine Baker in her military uniform. Well, I barely knew about Josephine back then, but you kind of recognize that face. And I thought, what, what is she doing in a military uniform? I couldn't get it. Of course I was in France, so, and I don't speak enough French to ask the questions. So it was really when I came home from that trip that I looked her up. And, and then started kind of reading all the books. And I think I gave you, Amanda, a whole bunch of that stuff. <laughs> I, I have, I, I know I have yeah. them all. So yeah. we're gonna it's a learn a lot, lot more about this today. So in our exhibit, we include a, a bit of vintage Josephine Baker sheet music. And that is to tell the story of how she concealed intelligence that, that she had collected, written in invisible ink and secreted among these musical notes uh, during World War II. And I am incredibly excited to learn more about her spy craft from Damien this evening. So I'm gonna turn this over to Jana to do a proper introduction of Damien. Well, Damian Lewis, it is, uh, it's just a pleasure to be able to do this program with you. I received the book maybe, maybe a month ago and took my sweet time reading it because I, I really <gasps> loved the story so much. I thought I knew the story of uh, Josephine Baker. Um, and, and as I mentioned to you before we began, all I really knew was the outer wrapping of the story, what you're delivering to us in this book, uh, Agent Josephine is the heart of the matter. And I mean the heart in all of its, all of its configurations. Um, the fact that she loved France so much, uh, the fact that uh, her espionage career was born out of just tragic um, hardships back in, in America, in St. Louis, uh, racial strife and she was never accepted as an entertainer in America. Went to, went to Europe, they loved her, and then off she went into this career that, that was just such a pleasure to read about. I can't thank you enough for writing the book. I can't tell you how much admiration I have for you from finding these only recently declassified materials in France, in French, during a pandemic, I'd say it's really a job very well done. And I can't wait to hear you talk about your book. So welcome. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. What a wonderful introduction. Um, what, one thing I'd ask actually, my watch broke down yesterday, very unprofessional. So when I hit the 30 minutes mark, can you just give me a shout, warn me and I'll stop. I'll Is start. that okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, so 
the, the story of, of, of Agent Josephine and her war opens um, just prior to the outbreak of war in 1939. And it basically, the story begins with a, a bulletproof Rolls Royce driving through the streets of Paris. And in, in the rear of the chauffeur driven vehicle is Commander Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale, who was the secret intelligence service. So London's spy master in Paris, longstanding legendary figure. In fact, a very good friend of Ian Fleming uh, also a spy during the war, who was, of course, the, the, the future uh, creator of James Bond, the James Bond spy series. And, and Dunderdale is the, one of the models for James Bond, amazingly. And Dunderdale is on this mission to, to drive to the headquarters of the Dizian Bureau. The Dizian Bureau is the French counter espionage service in Paris. And he has on his person proof that the foremost French traitor prior to the war prior to the outbreak of war is passing uh, crucial intelligence to the Germans, to the German Abwehr, so the German Foreign Intelligence Service. And the secret intelligence service in London have been intercepting these documents that he's been sending. And he's taking the, another batch to the Dizian Bureau to alert them to the depths of this man's treachery, which basically pertains to the French fleet. The French fleet at that time being the fourth, fourth most powerful in the world. So this is very serious business. When he arrives at the Dizian Bureau headquarters, he meets Colonel Paul Pellol, uh, the head of the German desk at the Dizian Bureau, and also his deputy, Jacques Abte, a long-standing French agent. And the problem with trying to track down this, this, this uh, standout traitor who's sending his material from Paris, is that he is signing off on his missives only with the letter A. They presume that is the first initial of his surname, but they have no proof. And the breakthrough comes when the man known as A sends an alert to the Abois saying that he will meet them in Brussels uh, with two, suitcase full, two suitcases stuffed full of top secret French intelligence to hand over. And when they find out the date of the meeting, Colonel Pellol gets all of the hotel registration cards from Brussels for that weekend and they painstakingly go through them all and they find out that one man has registered in Brussels for that weekend under the name of Henri Aubert, who actually declares on his hotel registration form that he's an officer in the French Navy. Navy sorry. They, they in due course arrest Aubert and they catch him in the cabin of his warship copying out the top secret French naval codes to send to the Abwai, the last chapter of his treachery. Uh, Orbert is, is uh, made to confess and he's been, he's been uh, betraying the French military and the allies uh, per se uh, for money, for, for very generous payments from the Abwai. And so what the, what, what the Dizian Bureau and Dunderdale decide to do is rather than simply stopping the flow of intelligence, they decide to insert themselves in Obert's place, pretend to still be him, and send the Abwa uh, false intelligence as a sting operation, and to, crucially to receive in exchange the payments that the Abwa are sending, because the Dizian Bureau is building up a slush fund, a secret fund of cash for the trouble they know that is coming, because the British and French intelligence services working very closely together prior to the war, they knew that when Nazi Germany invaded, that France would fall. They had no doubt that France could not stand against the onslaught. And at that stage, the French intelligence service would have to go underground and it would need secret funds. The other thing that becomes clear uh, in the light of Albert's treachery is the terrible lack of agents that the French secret intelligence service and indeed the British secret intelligence service have at that time. They are woefully underfunded, both of them, largely because the French government and the British government do not want to accept face reality that there is going to be another war with the old enemy Germany so, sh so shortly after, so relatively shortly after the First World War. And because of that, they are, they are painfully lacking in agents to combat the Abwehr's activities. And so the one means by which the French intelligence services decide that they can actually boost the number of their agents is to call for volunteers, freelance operatives, what are known in France as the honorary correspondents. And these are individuals who, because of their work or their family connections or their background, 
make for natural spies. So actually journalists and writers travel the world, they take notes everywhere, they ask difficult questions, they make great uh, uh, voluntary agents. But so too do international entertainers because they too have the ability to travel all over the world and they move in high society circles. And it was because of that that the suggestion was made, uh, not without its controversy at the time, that an approach should be made to Josephine Baker, who was at that time the most photographed woman in the world, arguably the most famous female superstar at the time, a star or standout star of, of, of screen, stage and song, um, and who'd made her fortune in Paris and across Europe. It was not a popular suggestion. There are, the, the reasons for this are, are, are several, but the main ones are that there was a natural uh, prejudice against women at the time uh, in British and French intelligence circles, of course wrong, but it, but it existed. And secondly, because um, Pelol and Abte and others in, in the Dazim Bureau feared that Josephine Baker would be like those, and I'm quoting, showbiz per fragile showbiz personalities who would shatter like glass at the first hint of any danger. But Ab Ab Abte, Jacques Abte, Pelot's deputy, is persuaded to go and at least sound Josephine out. So he drives out to her chateau on the outskirts of Paris. He's expecting to meet the archetypal Josephine Baker, uh, you know, ball gown, dripping in diamonds, maybe Chiquita, her, her, her cheetah on its diamond studded leash. Josephine was a lifelong lover of animals and they were part of her stage show. That's what he's expecting to meet. Instead, he pulls through the gates of the chateau. There is a cry of hello from the gardens and he looks up to see a figure emerge dressed in a battered felt cap, old gardening trousers and clutching a rusty tin can full of snails in her hand. It is Josephine Baker and the snails she's gathering are to feed to her pet ducks, which live in the pond of her chateau. It's not quite what Abte was expecting and he's led into the, into, into the drawing room where they're served chilled champagne and they settle in front of the fireplace. Now, of course, when you're recruiting a, a, an honorary correspondent, a freelance spy, you can't simply pop the question and say, hello, would you like to be a freelance spy for France? Because that's you know, not how it's done. You have to sound the person out. So Jacques Abte and Josephine make small talk. And this is the key thing. Very quickly, Abte realizes something quite extraordinary. The point is this, Josephine Baker had this incredible, almost unique ability to reach out from the stage when she was performing and touch every individual in the audience personally as if she was performing specifically for him or for her. It was a magical quality that very, very few, very, very few performers possess. In fact, Jean-Pierre Reggiori, who was one of her dance partners who lives in New York, lovely man, ex explained to me what it was like to stand in that presence, that magnetic, amazing presence. Jacques Abte, Josephine ba Baker's would-be recruiter at the Dazim Bureau is being treated to an up close and personal episode of that magnetic quality that Josephine had, has, and he is awestruck. And he thinks to himself, if we can harness that quality, that ability to seduce and, uh, and, and, and impress and touch, reach out and touch, just by her magnetic uh, quality, she will be a world beating spy. And so he pops the question to her, Josephine, uh, would you be willing to spy for France as an honorary correspondent? And she says, and again, I'm paraphrasing words to the effect, France has made me all that I am and I will give this country my life if I have to. Why does she have those sentiments? Because Josephine left America, age 19, sailed for France with a heart in her mouth because this was a leap into the unknown, because she had suffered prejudice in, in the United States and she just couldn't make it as a standout st uh, performer uh, in, in, in the country of her birth. And, and, and Paris and France and Europe had embraced her and she had, and she had, been, she had grown wings and been allowed to fly. And so the very idea to Josephine that this freedom, this, this freedom, this ability to be who she wants to be, is suddenly going to be taken from her by the onslaught, the march of Nazism and the evils and the prejudice that, that it, it, it espoused. And not only that, but the rest of the free world would be threatened by the same. Where could she flee to if that happened? So 
she has no choice but to stand the fight. So when she's offered this opportunity, Josephine embraces it with both hands. Uh, Jacques Abde sets her a first mission and it's to find out the intentions of the Italians should uh, war be declared, as everyone knows it will be. Will they join Berlin? Will they join the Nazis in, in the Axis powers? Nobody knows, but, we, but the Allies want to be sure. Very quickly, Josephine, who has very high level connections within the Italian embassy in Par Paris, finds out that material, that, that information. She seduces, possibly physically, certainly intellectually, one of the military attaches in the Italian embassy and finds out those details. She passes them on to Abte. It's passed right up the chain to top leaders in France and in Britain, and everybody is, is suitably impressed. But very quickly, of course, the forces of Nazi Germany invade France. And by June 1940, Paris is set to fall. One must, it, I can't stress enough how rapid the fall of France is. The Dizian Bureau and the French and the British Secret Intelligence Service, they knew France wouldn't stand, but no one believed in their wildest, wildest nightmares that it would fall within a matter of days. It's, it's unprecedented and ev everybody is so ill prepared that by the time the Dizian Bureau have loaded their precious files onto a convoy of trucks to try and rush them south out of Paris to somewhere of safety to re-establish the secret intelligence service, everything is in chaos, the roads are flooded with refugees and they are terrified that all the files are going to get seized by the Nazis with the consequences you can imagine, all their agents would be exposed. What does Josephine do? Well, there's a queue of Americans at the American Embassy in Paris getting stamps in their passports and visas to travel back to America. They are citizens of a neutral nation and they are traveling home to safety and why not? Does Josephine join them? Does she help? Josephine gets in a car, her Delage motor car, crams it full of refugees and, and, and other assorted would-be resistance and she travels south to the, to the Chateau de Milan in, in the Dordogne area of France, which she's rented just shortly before the war. This 14th century chateau, unbelievably beautiful building, becomes the, the, the headquarters of the resistance that she then begins to organize. But what nobody knows is how to resist, how to fight back, because no one's had the time or the wherewithal to plan for this or to stash arms or to build a shadow intelligence service. And to give you an idea of how cataclysmic it was the fall of France for, for the intelligence services in Britain and in, and in France, when France fell, London had not a single spy or source left in France. It was completely blinded. And that was the, the birth, really, of Josephine's first one of her standout, absolutely standout uh, intelligence missions of the war. So summer 1940, Colonel Paul Pellon and Jacques Abte, they realise that they have to gather intelligence in an underground fashion, and they are doing so very effectively. They're finding out where the Luftwaffe air bases are, which will fly the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. They're finding out, they're getting photographs of the invasion craft, which are gathering to invade Britain. They got plans for the Nazis to invade Ireland and Gibraltar. They have gathered reams of intelligence, but they have no way at all of getting it to Britain. There, there are no wireless sets, there are no couriers, there are no agents with contact to London. But Josephine has the ability to travel. And when Josephine Baker, the star, travels, she does so with her huge tour trunks, dozens of them stuffed full of her tour costumes, all the paraphernalia for the stage, but also her musical score sheets. And on those can be transcribed in invisible ink. This, the, the secret intelligence that, that the French underground intelligence service has gathered. Some of the material will have to be sent as raw intelligence, photographs and documents, because it cannot be transcribed. You know, London needs to see the photographs of the invasion craft, for example. But if Josephine can hide all this material in her tour trunks, surely she can get it through. It's exactly the mission that is planned. Jacques Abte travels to Chateau de Milan, and he suggests to Josephine that this is exactly what they need to do. And of course, Josephine steps forward and she says, look, she said, I've got fantastic contacts in Lisbon, the capital of Portugal. I can organise a series of shows, bona fide proper shows with posters pasted all around the streets of Lisbon. Josephine is travelling to Lisbon, a neutral country, to perform and entertain. People still needed to be entertained in the war. And in Lisbon, in the British Embassy, was a cell 
of the British Secret Intelligence Service. I'm sure there still is. And so if they could get the, the documents into the hands of that cell, from there they could be flown by uh, the regular um, BOAC flights to London. That would be the route to get them there. But to do so, they would have to travel across France, cross the border into Spain, run numerous customs and Gestapo checkpoints to eventually get all of that material to Lisbon. They set out in October 1940, so just a matter of months after the fall of France. They are carrying all of the intelligence gathered by the underground French intelligence service since the fall of France in June 1940. That can't be stressed enough. This is war winning material. And the most extraordinary thing is that the, the Jacques Apte, who's traveling with Josephine, is posing as a former ballet dancer from, Mas, from Marseille, the French city, who is now her tour manager. That's his cover. He's got a false name and a false passport. And Josephine says, that's not enough. In your passport, I'm going to get stamped through my contacts, accompanying Josephine Baker as her tour manager. So you've got an extra layer of cover. That means if I get arrested, you're doomed, but if you get arrested, I'm doomed. Uh, and as Josephine Baker is so instantly recognizable, I can't have a false passport, I can't have a cover. My only cloak and my only dagger is myself acting as Josephine the performer. That is the only uh, armor that I will have to see me through. And that's exactly what she does. At every checkpoint, at every railway station, at every crossing, at every time they're stopped, Josephine breezes off the train, beautiful and radiant in her furs and her jewellery and commanding admiration on all sides and it's that star quality and that incredible poise that she has knowing the stakes involved in this mission knowing what will happen to her if she's caught because she won't Obviously, she would be executed. And, and incidentally, the way the Germans had developed, the Nazi Germany had developed to execute spies was particularly horrific. They would uh, behead them face up, looking into the guillotine rather than the other way around. But before being executed, terrible things would happen to a spy like Josephine of Kapoor. She knows that. Yet she breezes through all those checkpoints, all those Gestapo points, all the customs checks, absolutely unperturbed, and they get all of that material through to Lisbon, 40 files worth of intelligence are delivered to the British Embassy and are rushed by plane to London, whereupon Wilfred Biffy Dunderdale, of course, receives them and telegraphs uh, Lisbon to tell them both that he is absolutely delighted with what they have sent him. But now comes this kind of sting in the tail. Josephine and Jack were determined to travel to London on that same BOAC flight to meet with General de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French, who has inspired them via his speeches over the summer to, to, to resist. And Dunderdale said, don't, says, do not come. We need you back in France. And we need you back in France because you have re-established the pipeline of intelligence, the flow from the underground French intelligence service to the secret intelligence service in London. We need you to go back and make that pipeline flow. That is the key thing you can do. That's your key task. And so Jacques Abte says, you know, to, to, to Josephine, one of us needs to return and she volunteers to go herself. And so she departs on her first solo intelligence mission, leaving Jacques Abte to remain in Lisbon, to lies with Dunderdale and to kind of put the, um, put the bigger picture plan together of how the pipeline will work. She returns to France, to Marseille, the city, the port city on the Mediterranean. She links up with, with Colonel Pelol, and Pelol says, obviously he's overjoyed at the success of their mission. He is overjoyed that the, 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 the flow of intelligence to the secret intelligence service in London can be reestablished. But he says to Josephine, you must perform. He says, you must put on a show here in France because Josephine has vowed never to sing or to dance in France while there's still a Nazi remaining on French soil. And Pelos says, you cannot, you, you cannot take that standpoint because although I appreciate the reason, you know, you, your values and your, and your reasons for doing so, he says, you have to perform because your performance is your cloak and your dagger, it's your cover. And if you don't perform, you are being exposed. And he says, you also have to perform because Josephine had vowed never to get paid for any of the intelligence work she did throughout the war. And 
Pelo says you will run out of funds. And so Josephine agrees to put on a, a comic opera called La Creole that, uh, that, that winter, so the winter of 1940 uh, in, in Marseille. And it's one of the things that kind of struck me again and, and again and again about Josephine's story uh, throughout the war. And she is a standout spy for, for the duration of the war. So right the way through to the liberation of, 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 of France and then the march into Germany. And the one thing, one thing that struck me time and time and time again was how she was unbreakable and undaunted and unbending. Her, her absolute commitment to fight the Nazi threat come what may, uh, was, was just, yeah, it, it beggared belief. And, and to give you an indication of how, um, of how surprising it is, you would imagine that the, the, the seasoned spies, the seasoned operatives, uh, Dunderdale, uh, Colonel Pelol, Jacques Abte, um, would be the ones to shore up Josephine, who was the rookie spy, the, the agent learning the ropes. Quite the reverse is true. At every stage, at some stage for each of them throughout the war, they lose heart. Colonel Pellol does, Jacques Abte does, Dunderdale does. That, 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 you know, that they believe the war is lost. And, and you know, until 1943, late 1943, it really looked like the war was lost to the Allies. Josephine never believes it for one moment. Whenever she hears their concern or their worry, she says, there's nothing to worry about. We will win this war because America will join the war. And when America joins the war, you have never seen what America look, America is capable of and we will win. And just to kind of round off, because I guess I'm pushing up to the 30 minutes mark. When Josephine, after her various espionage missions in France, she, she has to flee France in early 1941 because she's on the Gestapo hit list and they're coming for her. And she, she travels to and moves to Casablanca and sets up a new uh, intelligence hub. Uh, and, and carries out fantastic missions there. But the key point I wanted to make was that Josephine is operating there in preparation for the Operation Torch landings, which is when American and British forces land in North America, sorry, North Africa, to make it the springboard for Europe, for the liberation of Europe. So in, in, in the autumn of 1942. Um, and Josephine and Jack Abte, who, they're this, they're, they're this world beating espionage partnership throughout the war, they are key to that operation taking place to such an extent that the, the American diplomat spies that they were working with shortly before the torch landings take place, they come and meet Josephine. They've been working with her and Jacques Abte throughout the whole of this operation. They say to her and, and Abte, America will never forget what you have done for us in terms of making this operation possible. So those are just a few kind of, you know, broad brushstroke sketches of of, of Josephine's entry into the world of espionage and some of the key uh, the key achievements, um, but you know again just just to reiterate, struck time and time and time again how Josephine went from being the rookie agent to the to the to the spy master. She goes from the pupil to the master within a year, and she is she's unbreakable throughout the whole of the Second World War. Do you, Damien? Do you want to? Um, go through these slides, or how do you want to? Oh, work? okay. Uh, yeah, I guess we could call them up in the Q and A. I'd forgotten about them completely. Sorry, I got so carried away. No, you are so fascinating. I'm sorry to interrupt you, John, but if we could go through them and then we can stop sharing. Yeah. Do you want, do you want me to just give a quick commentary on each one? Would that help? Yeah. yeah Is that okay, John? Yeah. Fine with me. Sure. All right. Let's look. Say I, who's there we go. So this is obviously just Josephine in performance mode. Um, th these th these uh, photographs by the are from the service historic de la Defense, which is the French um, military archival service. And and you know I've got to give a huge shout out to the French for declassifying World War II secret intelligence service files, which are where these are from. These are the photographs from those files that were so hard to get. Yeah, next one. So Josephine is surrounded by some of those individuals who she worked with throughout the war. Um, I mean, she was actually made a, 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 an officer of the French Air Force as a kind of cover for her wartime intelligence work. But most, most of the war she actually performed out of uniform. You'll see her in a uniform in a minute. And just bear in mind that 
for the rest of her career, so from 1945 onwards, if Josephine was ever asked, what is the thing you're most proud of in your life? Maybe people would expect the performance to be mentioned. No, she'd always say the war years. Next slide. That's Chateau de Milan. So that's the, uh, the resistance headquarters that Josephine built, built in the Dordogne in the summer of 1940. It's from there, that chateau that she set, set out with her trunks full of that secret intelligence service material to travel to Lisbon. Next slide. And again, this, the, the chateau once more. They had a radio transmitter secreted in one of those towers and they had uh, direct contact to London to the secret intelligence service at times with that. Next slide. Josephine with her um, French Air Force um, colleagues and that, I don't know if you can see it, the little dog under her coat. So as I said, Josephine had a menagerie of animals uh, as part of a, a tour. By the end of the war, she'd lost all of her animals and that little dog was the, all she had left and she'd nicknamed it Mitralette, which in French is little machine gun. Next <laughs> oh slide. That, that's amazing. So Josephine with, with um, Dumisil Guillet, who was the, her recruiter into the Women's uh, Auxiliary Air Force, a standout war hero herself, who became one of Josephine's greatest champions after the war. So when they were fighting to get Josephine the Légion d'Honneur, which was a real fight, by the way, uh, and should not have been, but was, uh, Dumisil Guillet was a real, Commander Guillet was a real, champion for Josephine. She knew what she, she had achieved during the war. Uh, next slide, please. And that's again Josephine with her little dog, Mitralette. And actually this is, she would, this is the only animal she would, and she returned to France in just after D-Day. And then she, she advanced with the troops at the front line, performing for the troops right the way through to the liberation of Germany. Next slide. Uh, Josephine performing. So this is North Africa performing for some of the troops, uh, you know, so she doubled towards the end of the war as a performer, but also gathering intelligence at the same time. Uh, next slide. Or was that maybe it? Ah, yeah. And, and then the, the, the journal of the, um, the unit she served for. The reason this is in there is because she actually survives a plane crash at sea when she's traveling back to France uh, after during the liberation of France from North Africa. Um, believed to be sabotage. The plane loses both of its engines. It has to crash land in the sea. It's recorded. The story is recorded in that journal. And uh, luckily, Josephine and, and the crew survive. I think those, that's it, is it? Yeah. That is it. Over to you, Jana. That was wonderful. Uh, I, could, I could keep listening for a considerable amount of time. I would... Um, I would like to ask you how you first got interested in her story. Where did you where did you begin uh, with this 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 uh, researcher's curiosity about this incredible woman? What piqued your interest? Initially? You know, it's probably about about ten years ago, and it was just a little tiny snippet that I picked up. I, I can't remember on the internet, Facebook, even maybe that Josephine Baker was a spy, and I thought to myself, that is not possible because Josephine Baker was this incredibly well-known high profile performer, how could she possibly have served as an agent of the shadows? It just seemed, you know, kind of preposterous. And so I started kind of digging from there and then really by serendipity, my father lives in France. He sold our very modest home in England and bought a 14th century chateau in France, completely derelict. It had cattle living in it many years ago and he renovated it. This was his retirement project. And because he loves chateaus, he goes to visit chateaus all the time. And he went to Josephine Baker's chateau to see the chateau, not knowing her story. And then he called me afterwards and said, there is this story about this lady who served as a spy during the war. You must come and look. I said, well, I've been researching that story for, 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 for years. And, and, and yeah, I mean, so I then went over and went with my father and my stepmother to the chateau. And uh, just that was then, that was the crossing of the Rubicon. The story had to be told. Fascinating. Well, you know, after the war, she adopted, what, a dozen international children and uh, uh, positioned them at that chateau and raised them. That was her rainbow tribe. And it became, I think, um, uh, a very interesting place for a lot of people to stop and take a look at her view 
of how the world might be with all the races, all the religions, all in one place. I would wanna ask you if you uh, would agree with me that it was partly due to her very rough upbringing um, in East St. Louis where they had a race riot where 39 people were killed. She grew up in the poorest part of the city. She was, um, as you pointed out, it was impossible for her to have a career there. Then she goes to Europe and discovers that that sort of prejudice doesn't exist in Europe. And then here came the Nazis. So prejudiced against not just blacks, but Jews. They had a long list of people that they were uh, wanting to get rid of. Do you think it was that piece of her personality that formed this incredible backbone that she demonstrated through the war? How do you put that together? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Look, look, Josephine was a tough cookie, okay? She, she was a street fighter. You know, when she grew up barefoot going to school, you know, scavenging coal from the locomotives to throwing it down to a street gang to, you know, fuel their homes. You know, she, she, she grew up fighting, she grew up strong and she'd had it tough. And, you know, she was forged in fire. And that meant that, you know, freedom and opportunity and, and the ability to be who she could be meant so much more to her, you could argue, than to someone who was born to it or someone who had it easy. So you can imagine what it was like for her when the Nazis won, made her, identified her personally as an enemy of the Nazi state, put her on the front of one of Joseph Go Goebbels' leaflets as epitomising everything the Nazi regime stood against, and then threatened to invade her adopted home, but also subjugate the whole world to their credo basically of hatred and prejudice you know yeah she she had fighting in her soul in her heart and her soul and 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 she you know she a lot of people have asked me have read the book because she ruined her health in the war she lost her health completely because of the stress of repeated missions a lot of people have said to me look after the first year or the first two years she'd done so much why did she not then say i'm exhausted i need to go back to america she never once stepped away she didn't even imagine for one moment that it was appropriate to do so. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you asked yourself this reading the book. I'd be curious to know if you did, because so many times I, I, I had to ask myself, would I have had the courage? Would she, I have had the courage? She was, if I was an American, you know, superstar in uh, Paris at that time, would I have had the courage to stay and fight? Jana would have. Well, you know, I, I would make the case that she she didn't stop there because it was, uh, when was it? Uh, when um, was in the 60s when Martin Luther King was standing on the mall giving his, uh, his, his speech. Um, Josephine Baker was standing behind him. She got involved in the civil rights movement, movement in America. Could you consider that to be a little continuation of what she was fighting for in Europe, perhaps? Absolutely. Again, you've hit the nail on the head. Look, before the war, she was this global superstar, you know, and rightfully so, but she wasn't, how can you put it, a woman of gravitas? Maybe she hadn't found a mojo. She didn't know her calling. The war was the watershed. You know, the watershed moment actually was when, do you remember in the book where she's asked in 1943, late 1943, by all the American generals, Will you please perform for the American troops freshly landed in North Africa? And she goes to perform and she sees they're segregated. And she's like, why are we fighting the Nazis if you're segregating black troops and white troops in the American armed forces? What is going on? I'll perform for the forces, but I will only perform for them if they are not segregated when I perform. So, you know, she she. The, the cause she took up and the stand she made in the war became the springboard for all her civil rights work, you know, afterwards. And as you rightly say, you know, not just speaking alongside Martin Luther King, but when he was assassinated, she was invited to actually lead the movement in the States. Right. You know, she, she was a woman of incredible substance, you know, post-war. And most people know none of this. They only know that she was, you know, this incredible uh, Beyonce of her time. One more point though, I think at the end, after the war, after all of that, she went back to Paris and she reconstituted her show and she did a final performance at um, a theater called the Bobino. That's right, yeah. 
where she had started. And um, my understanding is that she just brought down the house. She had um, all of these newspaper reviews, each one more laudatory than the one before. And she was the last day of her life in her hotel room, surrounded by these fabulous newspaper reviews of her last performance, as it turned out. And that's that was the end of her life right then. Yeah, amazing, absolutely. Amazing ending. Absolutely. And you know, she was asked several times, you know, by the French media during that 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 show, which was an absolute, you know, she bought the house down. Yeah. Um, and and she was asked several times, what are you most proud? Because it was it was a 50-year retrospective, and what are you most proud of? And it was the war years. The war years featured in the show she had a jeep she bought onto stage reminiscent of the jeep she drove you know throughout north africa so yeah she she went out as she as she always you know that said she would do she went out singing and dancing it's an amazing story it's just an amazing story i i'm so thrilled that your book is going to open her story up to a, a, a huge audience that should read it and will read it and um you know, we, we, we may never be able to, uh, to um, remember when Josephine wasn't known as this hero, uh, this, this heroic woman who was undercover, but was it hiding in plain sight, as Tony Mendez would say. Her cover was being out in front, not in the shadows, not trying to blend in, but taking that personality of hers and, and using it in the most um, in the most amazing way possible. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, hiding in plain sight. That that's what she did. <laughs> Spectacularly, with her cheetah Chiquita. <laughs> <on a leash. laughs> what a, what a woman! Well, thank you for the book. Um, I'll I'll be looking through it more than once uh, in in the weeks to come, and. Um, you've you've uh you've written something that will that will last thank you time. i really appreciate it really appreciate it donna i thought for sure you were queuing up to ask him if there were any plans to make the book perhaps a visual feature <laughs> well you know having gone through that process uh, as we did and knowing that it's kind of fits and starts and you think yes and then maybe and then oh it's yes again and I'm almost afraid to ask, but it's it's such a, a mesmerizing story that I will ask. Are they going to put this on film? Yeah, so th there there is a um, there's a, a, a streaming series um, being developed based upon the wartime story and the book. Um, and I, you know what's great about it is this is a this is the wartime spying heroic Josephine. That's what's lovely about it. You know, it's it's the story that needs to be told. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure it'd be told in the right way. Uh, uh, Janelle Monet, the well-known singer and act actress, is um, is committed. She's she signed up to play Josephine, and you know, she's always been a fan of Josephine. So it's it's a great it's a great tie-up. Um, you know, I, I, I'm it's very exciting. And, and if we can, you know, if we can make this happen and people can see Josephine as she really was. I mean, th that's the other thing, you know, she, she never really spoke about this. Not really, not in any depth, not what she did in the war. She was immensely proud of it, but she never spoke about it. And you know, as well as I do, that's because you don't, you, you know, you, you were a secret intelligence service agent. You don't ever talk about it. And, and so she went to her grave with these secrets. So if we can now bring the story out, you know, when it's safe to do so, you know, um, and, and showcase her as she really was at that time, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? You know, we ha we haven't talked about the honors that she was given and and the and and the, the funeral. It was just kind of unprecedented in Paris for a, a, an American citizen uh, and a woman and um, someone from the war to, to be interred in the Pantheon, for instance, uh, and to be honored uh, just all kinds of medals. And I don't remember the names of the medals, but I know she had a lot of them. Yeah, no, I mean, she, she, she won the Croix de Guerre, um, across the War Cross um, with Palm and the French Resistance Medal. 
I mean, uh, De Gaulle, you know, personally, uh, you know, um, made sure she got those, but she was, she eventually got the Legion d'honneur, which is the highest French um, decoration you can get for, um, for, 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 for valor or civil service, but it took a long time. And, you know, I mentioned Dumas el Guillet, the lady who recruited her into the French Women's Auxiliary Air Force. Dumas el Guillet and others had to really fight to get Josephine that medal. And, you know, they said, that honor and they said you know is this because she's a woman is this because she's black you know come on guys you it was not until 1957 they finally got it through it was refused time and time again um and then of course very recently in the last year she was elevated to the french pantheon in which there are i think 85 individuals and only five or six women now josephine being one of them that's the highest honor possible in the french nation so yeah, I mean, you know, she has been she's been recognized for um, her standout qualities, but, it, you know, never really her story from the wars never really been told. And, and it, you know, it's it's never been possible to tell it really until now with those files being released. And, and again, you know, hats off to the French government. Big, big congratulations to the French government for doing that, you know, releasing those secret um, intelligence service files from the war. That's that's an amazing thing to have done. I want to say congratulations to you for for getting the good getting those documents for uh, distilling them and and pulling this information out of it. How difficult was it for you to uh, to track down the documents? Telling, I mean, it's this is this is the nitty gritty of these uh, espionage operations. Plus, there's a there's a little bit of a story in this book about an incredible romance. <laughs> How hard was it for you to put these pieces together to develop this fully formed story that uh, that you present in the book? It, it was um, unusually challenging. And it, 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 it mean, just as a practical, so um, the, the French government released those files only in the last 18 months, two years. And so they did so right in the midst of COVID. And so I couldn't go to France. So I had to use a French researcher. Hmm. And, and that I, I sent her god bless her to the french archives maybe a dozen times and each time she'd come back and she'd have to digitize and email me the files and i'd say actually laurence that's not the right file you know can you go back and so she really really doggedly um searched and searched and eventually we found the, the right files which were they weren't trying to hide them it was just covid and lockdown you had to book a long time in advance uh, it was it was just difficult to get them um but so that was one challenge but the other really significant challenge and one I didn't expect you'll appreciate this people had told the story of their espionage during the war in some on some levels in some depth but they're told stories with deliberate obfuscations and deliberate contortions of the truth to hide what really happened because in the second world war France was occupied you know brother was pitted against sister you know brother against brother, wife against husband, village against village, because there were collaborators, there were secret agents, there were people with the resistance. And those, those difficult traumas exist to this day in France. And so a lot of the stories that have been told were told to disguise what really happened. And then you'll appreciate this, you've read the book. They push the boundaries of what's legal and what's not what's right. That's not the right word. But what would be justified outside of a time of war, okay? So they worked with assassins and forgers and the, and the mafia, and they did so without any blessing from on high, no clearance from headquarters. They were freelance agents out there doing what you had to do to defeat the greatest evil, and they would work almost with the devil himself if it would defeat the Nazis. You can do that in a time of war, but when the war's over and the powers that be find out, find out that you cut a deal with the Mafia in North Africa to gather intelligence without any permission to do so, you can't really tell that story because that isn't possibly what it will now be viewed as the right thing to do. Does that all make sense? So sifting the fact from fiction and that was that was quite a challenge. Yeah, quite quite a challenge, I have to say. That makes more sense to me than you can imagine. What about the romance? What about digging out the story of the romance? I knew that Abte. I knew that he worked closely with her. I knew that there was a, a long relationship. I never knew that it was a, a romantic relationship. It was kind of a wonderful discovery in the middle of the book 
that she was not alone. You know? No, I mean, you'll appreciate this again, you know, um, war and all it brings, you know, uh, I was a war reporter for 20 years. You get thrust into situations where very, very deep and meaningful relationships develop almost overnight because you're in extremis. Uh, and that's exactly what happened between Jacques Abdé and Josephine. Both were married at the time. Um, Josephine, estranged from her husband, Jean Lyon, uh, a French Jewish industrialist, Jacques Abdé. Um, but they fell in love. They fell in love very quickly. And the, the most amazing thing about that relationship is that, and it's very French, you know, the French are very, um, I don't like to be kind of like um, stereotypical, but they are, that they're, love, they're the lovers of the French, you know, they love their wine, they love their food, they love each other. Um, and, you know, it's it's a very French thing. That that fusion of Jacques Abte and Josephine, it, she calls him a knight in shining armour, you know, without any embarrassment that's what she says you know in my time of need he comes and 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 for him she is his muse she is his inspiration throughout the war that's the great thing about it he's her he's her spy master supposedly but very quickly she becomes his muse and inspiration and eventually almost spy chief and so their love affair their, their love throughout the war doesn't in any way shape or form jeopardize or impact upon their ability to keep spying in fact i think it makes it it, it, it's stronger and after the war that that relationship endures you know I'm not saying it endures romantically but it certainly endures as a very special connection between them Josephine kept a house in the grounds of her chateau for the rest of her life when she had the chateau for Jacques Abte and eventually came and lived there and painted pictures of the chateau they were they had this special connection wow mm. it's resonating here <laughs> Uh, it, it, it really is. Well, the, the story itself is, is, uh, is fantastic. When they, when, they, when they film it, when they put it on film, why don't you make sure that they include um, 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 a piece of, of uh, film with her flying? Because I know she, at some point, yeah. she had a pilot's license. Absolutely. And I, I just love to see a picture of her up in an airplane. You know, Absolutely. And, and, and she flew those missions, of course, didn't she? You know, um, during the phony war, she flew... Um, at, under the cover of the Red Cross to, yeah. you know, to, to, to the low countries. And, yeah. you know, for sure there was spying sprinkled into that. I mean, you know, um, lots you can't put in the book, but yeah. She, I mean, she was, a, you know, she was, she was a, a lady of many, many qualities and talents. Imagine that, huh? When you mentioned the Red Cross, I told you I had seen big posters of her on a large yeah. fence by the Luxembourg. That may have had something to do with her work with the Red Cross. That may be who was sponsoring whatever it was that was going yeah. on. Yeah, she, 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 you know, she sang and performed benefits for the Red Cross before the war, throughout the war and after the war, you know. Um. I am going to jump in because we're running out of time with just a few. We have a lot of audience questions and we will not get to all of them, but there are just a couple that I thought were so excellent. Um, someone wants to know who did she, what service did she report to? SIS, MI6, SOE, or was she a special case above so it, the bureaucracy? So initially she reported obviously to the Dizian Bureau and the Dizian Bureau then shared that intelligence with, with Dunderdale, who was Secret Intelligence Service, SIS. Once, once France fell and then, you know, the French intelligence service went underground, she basically reported to London to the secret intelligence service. And then when she moved to North Africa, she then also became a spy for America. So she was then reporting via the American diplomat spies in North Africa to London and then on to Washington. So hence she was a spy for France, Britain and, 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 and America. Just incredible. Um, someone asked about, how did she evade capture while giving performances in occupied France? So when she performed La Creole, yeah, uh, it, which was in uh, December 1940, um, she had to cut a show short by three weeks because the Gestapo had obviously uncovered her clandestine role and Pelol warned her they were coming for her. So she only gave that one performance in occupied France, had to cut it short and then had to flee to 
Vichy France, uh, so French North Africa. Uh, but, you know, she was hunted and stalked the whole time. And actually, part of the way she avoided capture was because of her, her, her stardom, you know, because, could, you know, it would be very hard to drag Josephine Baker into a Gestapo basement and make her disappear. It was that kind of bluff and front. Yeah. Was that hiding, um, in, pl hiding in plain sight part of it? She was untouchable. Yeah. Um, also, people are interested, you know, we, we know about her Rainbow Tribe, all her children. Did you by any chance um, get to interview any of them, Damien, or? I'm, I've been in touch with them, yeah. I mean, it, it, again, it seems strange. The, the focus of my book is purely the war years, and that's what I set out to do, because that's the part of the story which is unknown. And actually, Personally, I think it's the most incredible and compelling part of her story. She didn't really talk to anyone about it that much, not even those in her family. So, it, you know, it's tough to get any insight into that side of her story from anyone who was part of her family or the only people who could give you any more insight would be the, actually the agent she served alongside. So I've had huge help from all the families of the Pelol's family, Colonel Remy's family, um, Jacques Abte and, and, and his children and all the rest of it. That's the, that, those are the sources of insight. But even, you know, e even they have said, you know, to me, having read the book, you know, there's so much in here we had no idea about. Um, and that's, again, because, you know, the archives are, um, are the key. And just as one example, again, you know, um, when I was researching, so the Dunderdale connection was only possible to, 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 to prove categorically because of the French government releasing the files, which identified Dunderdale as being her, 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 her uh, London spy chief. And then the man who holds Dunderdale's private family archive, a chap called Paul Biddle, who lives in America, uh, reached out to me, I somehow he found out what I was doing, said, I've got all Dunderdale's archive, including all his materials from the war, from before the war, would you like to have access to it? So again, you know, all of that stuff never before seen the light of day and, and priceless in terms of the research. So um, yeah, uh, you couldn't tell the story without it. Amanda, back to that, to that question about her kids. Um, there was, there is a restaurant in New York City called Chez Josephine. There is, yeah. And it was run by. It was, yeah, absolutely. I don't know if it still is, but I no, went there. I went there when he was running it. Yeah. And it was pictures, huge paintings of her, someone playing the, on the piano, her her recipes that she served in her club in Paris, and it was American food. It was like fried chicken. You could get fried chicken if you went to Josephine's restaurant in Paris. It was very cool. Yeah. John, the rest of, go on. Go on. What? I was going to say, Jana and I have been hatching a plot for many years to yeah. um, have a special dinner there for spy enthusiasts. So please flood um, our inboxes if that appeals to anybody who's listening. What were you going to say, Damien? No, I was going to say the restaurant's still there. And it's, um, yeah, it, 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 unfortunately, it, the, 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 the chap who ran it, um, has passed passed away a few years ago, but it's still there and vibrant and still celebrates her memory, as you know. So yeah, a, a must, a must. Um, in fact, I got Jean Pierre Leguiori, her former dance partner, to take a photograph of uh, the book, Agent Josephine, at uh, Josephine's, you know, Chez Josephine in 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 the restaurant itself, because I just thought that would be a really lovely. Because uh, he lives in New York, so. Yeah, they should put stacks of them by the uh, cash register so that after, <laughs> yes. you know after your <laughs> round Betty dessert you can you can buy a book. Yeah. <laughs> be great. Well, I am sad to say that we need to wrap up. This has been so amazing, Damien and and Jana. Your passion for Josephine shines through, and your your deep knowledge of what Josephine did because you've done the work yourself. Uh, it really was an incomparable conversation, and I can't thank you guys both enough, and Damien, for staying up so late for us, 
And our next program is on Thursday, August 11th at noon Eastern. It's Spy Chat with Chris Costa and uh, Gina Bennett. So we can learn, uh, hear from a, a current woman in intelligence. Um, not that you're not current, Jana. Um, please I'm not check. That current. You are, you are. I thought that doesn't sound good, but please check our website to register for this or any of the other programs we have for youth or adults. And if you enjoyed the program, as always, please help to continue uh, to allow us to hold these for free and bring them to you. And our donors support the Spy Museum all year. So we really appreciate that. And Thank you both so much. Damien, it was an honor. Thank you. Likewise, absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks. Cheers to Josephine, right, Jana? <laughs> absolutely, I'm gonna go have a glass of wine right now. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night. Good night.